Um, so today, I'm trying to remember where we left off because all my notes are at school. <laughs> I believe we left off talking about why plants um, are important. Say again. Why plants are important. Why plants are important. Beautiful. And also, I believe before that, we were talking about how um, plants, like the, the various different challenges, right? It was that. It was the opportunities and challenges of being on land. Yes, did we make two lists like that, I believe? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Thank you guys for the back and forth. I appreciate it. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna look at uh, ye old PowerPoint and we're gonna see what we can do here. So this is the next um, PowerPoint in our, discussion of plants. Um, a lot of this we've actually already covered because we were prepping for lab, right? So we've already talked about these life cycles. So I'm just gonna kind of flip through these slides pretty quickly. So here is a typical life cycle of a green alga. What type of life cycle is this y'all? I want you to know when I share screen, I can't see the chat. So you're gonna have to say stuff out loud. I mean, I can see the chat, but it blocks more of my screen. What kind of life cycle is this? Predominantly haploid. That was quiet, can you say again? Like haploid dominant, yeah. Beautiful. So is it an alternation of generations life cycle? You guys can do thumbs up and thumbs down in the reactions too. It is not an alternation of generations life cycle. It is simply a haploid dominant, right? So the organism spends the majority of its life in a haploid state. It's only with reproduction that it creates a zygote, which immediately undergoes meiosis to produce spores. And we're right back to being haploid. Yeah. Okay. So our plants all of the land plants have this alternation of generations situation happening, right? So this should look familiar, I hope. This is our fern life cycle, yeah? And it's moving to land, yeah. Okay, good, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm checking the chat, um, right? So we've got a multicellular diploid stage, a multicellular haploid stage, and they alternate, hence alternation of generations, right? Um, if you use Campbell, they use slightly different color coding. They use more of like an aqua and a like pinky tan, right? But we're gonna use red and blue because A, I have markers that color and B, <clears throat> it's easier to, it's more bold, okay? Um, but it's the same idea, right? And so this is sort of a typical life cycle, right? Um, so what we're gonna be doing is we are going to essentially continue what we started with lab and go through all the different groups of plants as they evolved. We're not gonna spend a bunch of time talking about these different green algae, okay? Um, we're mostly kind of using them as like an out group for the land plants, all right? So let's make a list, I suppose. We can start with a list. I think that would be a great idea of what are the characteristics, what are the new characteristics that are coming, right, that have occurred. Oh man, see, now I gotta figure out how to let people in when I'm, can I do that? I might have to stop sharing. Hold on, oh wait, there it is, okay, sorry, ugh. You guys, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, back to, back to sharing. All right, so let's make a list of um, what I like to call sometimes when I'm feeling sassy, the new hotness, okay? So let's make a list of characteristics that are different when we're comparing our non-vascular plants with green algae. So non-vascular plants, where do they live?
in comparison to green algae, I should say. On land? Beautiful. How is land different? <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> You have this in your notes, you guys. It's more like dry. Than dry. What else is, what other things are problematic? Less UV protection. Yeah, less UV, well, more UV, let's, <laughs> right? Rather than double negative. There's, there's more exposure to UV. Okay, what else? Gravity. Gravity, right, okay. So here's the kind of funny thing about, admit all. Okay, I'm figuring out what I'm doing, you guys. I'm, I kind of suck at Zoom, but there it is. Um, so here's the thing about um, our non-vascular plants. Okay, so this is who we're talking about right now. This is the list that I'm making, is I'm making a, a list about non-vascular plants. They kind of suck at being plants, okay? Um, and what I mean by that is they are not, as a group, particularly good at dealing with any of those challenges at least not as well as, you know, the plants that would evolve after them, okay? So these guys still live in very moist environments for the most part because they're not ready for, for the prime time of all of those challenges that you listed, right? So one thing that they do have that is cool is they have what is called a cuticle. And so a cuticle essentially is like a waterproof layer on the outside. And that helps to reduce water loss, okay? Um, one of the things we talked about last time was this idea, is it possible for that cuticle to be complete? Is it completely sealed all the way around? No, it's not. Why not? Because uh, it needs to let oxygen in and... Right, because it because we need gas exchange for both um, photosynthesis and for cellular respiration, right? We need to be able to do gas exchange. So the cuticle is not a complete cuticle. So it, it's not entirely waterproof, right? Um, the cuticle in the earliest um, non-vascular plants has pores in it, which are basically just little openings, essentially, okay? Um, but some of the slightly more sophisticated um, non-vascular plants start to have stomata. Do you guys remember learning about stomata in, um, in, uh, 40. What is what is what does stomata look like to you? What do they look like? They're weird. It's like a hole. Right, but they're a hole that has like a little. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember looking at these? You might not have. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much they go into this in 40, and it probably depends on the instructor. But there are these little, they're called guard cells. And there are these little cells that make like a, an opening that can be open or it can be closed. And so the beauty of, I know, with the visuals, right? I know you like it. Um, the, <laughs> the beauty of stomata is that you can open that up when you need to do gas exchange, but if it really dries out, right, you can close it so you're not losing any water. So those are sort of the, the more advanced version of a pore, right? Pores are just holes that are open all the time, right? So somata, open and close, and that's a big advantage. That's important, okay? Um, other than that though, they really don't have that many other, I don't think they have really any other features that are well suited to land. Because if we look at their life cycle, right? They're still using water for the sperm to swim to the eggs, right? Sperm are still swimming, okay? Um, 
They don't have any vascular tissue, so they're limited in their size. They can't get very large because they can't move water long distances. Um, for that matter, they can't move photosynthetic products long distances, right? So they're really, really limited in their size um, for that reason. And also, you know, the whole gravity issue too, right? The idea that it's like they don't have sturdy enough structures to really support them to grow beyond a certain size. So, um, you know, they're really not, they're, they're not, they're not really super with it. Okay. As far as living on land goes. Um, but we do have the alternation of generations, right? Um, and in this case, it's very, very similar to alternation of generations in the protists that do alternation of generations. So I hope you recall that some protists do alternation of generations. Um, all right. So we've got this, you know, okay, the spores can be dispersed by wind instead of water. So that's something, but you know, meh. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, so that's the, the new hotness, right? That's new or the key characters of, um, non-vascular plants and how they are different from, um, their predecessors, right? So the green algae, so they have, um, they have alternation of generations, which type? Give me the fighter spore fight dominant. The uh, haploid dominant? Right. So I'm going to say give me the fight dominant just because um, I want to have a, a, an even bigger distinction between give me the fight dominant alternation of generations is different from haploid dominant, no alternation, <laughs> right? Just haploid dominant. Yeah. So I'm going to lean into calling it. Um, gametophyte dominant. Oh, good. It'd be nice if I could spell. Let's try that again. Mint alternation. See, that's where my screen skips out of <laughs> generations. Okay. So um, I'm not going to draw these life cycles again because we already did it. So, um, you know, if you've got them in your lab notes and you're like, I should move this into my lecture notes, that might be a good idea, right? Maybe draw yourself a prettier kind of, you know, less on the fly version, right? So that it's easy to read, um, you know, or do whatever method works for you. If you're like, no, I like the book one. I just need to like, you know, print it, cut it out, stick it in my notes, whatever. But I do have a very important tip. And that very important tip is to understand life cycles, you have to practice drawing them. You have to. There isn't another way to learn it other than to like, which is why I take the time for every life cycle that we do for plants to draw it in class. Because if I just show you a picture and explain the picture, it doesn't have nearly as much like meaning in your brain as if you're drawing it yourself, okay? So I do strongly encourage you to practice drawing these as much as you can, okay? All right, so you know the moss life cycle, right? It is an alternation of generations. It has a uh, multicellular gametophyte and a multicellular sporophyte, but um, the haploid generation, the gametophyte generation is the one that is sort of the dominant life stage. Okay. And so here's what that looks like in Freeman. Here's what that looks like in, um, in Campbell, right? Essentially it's, you know, it's the same ish, right? Details are different, but same kind of thing. Okay. All right. So here are some handy dandy pictures of our, of our moss gametophytes and, oh, look, antheridia and eggs and, ooh, that's fun. The eggs are inside of the archegonia, the antheridia have sperm and, hey, that's rad, okay? And then look at these, we got spores, right? We've got our sporangium, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of cool, our sporophyte, right? So this is all familiar. Um, as are our liverworts. So our liverworts are another group of um, uh, that non-vascular plants, right? So we've got our gametophytes, which have kind of 
um, are female gametophytes, the archegonia, which have that kind of like um, umbrella shape or um, palm tree shape. And then you've got your male gametophytes, which are kind of more like a flat kind of flowery shape, I guess. Right. So we got antheridia, we got archegonia again. And the life cycle is similar in liverworts in that, remember, the sperm are who is swimming to the eggs. The eggs stay inside of the archegonia. The sperm swim and you need water to swim. So notice how all of these show water because that's important. This water, right, to, to swim over to where the archegonia are. Okay. Um, and then here is some archegonia where the egg has been fertilized. And now we have this essentially sporophyte in there, right? So this multicellular sporophyte kind of hanging underneath there like a little coconut under a palm tree. Yeah, anyway, okay. Um, there are other non-vascular plants. Hornworts are another one. We're not gonna talk about them at all, but they're kind of like a, they're, they're almost kind of like a cross between the way that a liverwort looks and the way that a um, moss looks. They're kind of in between, but they're another guy that has a similar kind of life cycle, okay? So some information about those guys. The reason we skip talking about hornworts is because there are just not that many of them. <laughs> Right. Um, and so as always, there's, you know, info about them in the, sorry, skipping, skipping, skipping in this little table, which is kind of cool. Um, so the liverworts are, are the most ancient type, right? They're the ones that the most ancestral um, of, you know, what the earliest plants, they're, they're the most similar to what the earliest plants looked like right? Um, and all of these guys have gametophyte dominant alternation of generations, life cycles, okay? Hornworts are the only ones that have stomata, just saying, okay? All right. Then in lecture, and then in lab, I should say, we talked about um, fern life cycles. So here's our fern life cycle, right? Isn't that cute? Okay, what is, what's new? What's better? What's happening here? What do we have? What's different? What, how did we classify the ferns and their buddies when we were talking about them in, for lab? I'm gonna go back up to this slide. They're vascular. They have vascular tissue, yes. Is there anything else? I don't know. Hold on. I'm erasing all the stuff about, I can erase well, I'm not erasing well. Poor Reed is having a hard time getting in. She keeps trying and for whatever reason, it's not going well. Okay, so now we're looking at, these guys, okay? So what's the, what's the new hotness with our seedless vascular plants? Well, they have vascular tissue. What does that mean? That's a big deal, right? So they can move water and sugar. I'm just gonna say sugar as a stand-in for, you know, photosynthetic products. Um, more effectively in their body. Or I should, let me just say through tissues. So instead of just diffusing from one cell to the next cell to the next cell, it's almost like the difference between like driving surface streets and driving the freeway, right? It's like things can move more easily from one place to another. Okay, and so you can see, if we look at this tree, right, you can see, all right, vascular tissues here, and then there's this little kind of side note over here that says vessel elements. Vessel elements are essentially, the way that I like to describe it to you guys at this level is, they're essentially like fancy vascular tissue. They are more effective, better vascular tissue. So you'll notice that some of the groups within both the seedless vascular plants, and then again, twice more in the gymnosperms and angiosperms, 
we have independent evolution of vessel elements. And you guys remember what it means when something evolves more than once, do you? Do you remember what that means? What does that mean? Convergence? That's what it's called, convergence. But what? what is the... What's the like punchline of that? Why convergence implies that a trait is similar because or they similar in its function. No, you're you're getting there. You're get you're close to what I'm looking for, but you're probably not even thinking that that's what I'm looking for. Really useful is what I'm looking for, right? So convergence happens when there is some sort of characteristic that is so useful that it evolves in different groups, right? Completely independently, right? That indicates that it's like, oh, this thing must be really good if it evolved separately more than one time, right? And it's, it's super useful, okay? So fancy vascular tissue in some groups. So not, right, I'm just, you know, that's what we're gonna call vessel elements for now, fancy vascular tissue. So, um, what do I mean by fancy? Um, it's better, right? It's it's um, more um, efficient, right? Than than the other kinds. Okay, um, a part of this development of vascular tissues is we're also starting to see more sort of true plant tissues. So in our non-vascular plants, we started to have things that were leafy, right? I mean, you know, you look at a liverwort and you're like, okay, that thing looks leafy. You look at a moss and it's like the little upside down Christmas tree looking thing. You know, it looks leafy, right? But they weren't really true leaves. They didn't have all of the tissues necessary for us to call them a true leaf. Um, and then the same thing with roots, right? In our non-vascular plants, we, there are these little kind of anchoring rootlets, you might want to call them, but they're not proper roots, okay? So we're starting to have true plant organs, right? Roots, leaves, okay? And um, not in all of them, right? So let's look at where the, where the, the little hash marks are, right? So we have vascular tissue in all of the seedless vascular plants because the, the little hash mark is way back here, right? We have roots in everybody except for the very earliest fossils only, okay? All right. And then we have vessel elements only in a few select groups, right? Um, and then we have true leaves. Who has true leaves in the vascular plant category? Who has true leaves? I'm gonna take a sip of coffee. You don't wanna hear me swallow, that's gross. So if my little hash mark is there, that means that everybody sort of downstream of that, that hash mark has them. So whisk ferns, which you haven't heard about yet, um, ferns and horse tails, which you did hear about, right? Those all have true leaves, even though in, um, thank you, Natalie, for putting that in the chat. Um, <laughs> um, horse tails, even though horse tails, you saw their leaves are these sad little pathetic, tiny little bleh, things, right? And if you didn't look at those in the lab, make sure you do, okay? Next time we're we're back there. Okay, so that's what's unique. Um, that's some of what's unique about vascular plants. What else is different about vascular plants? So let's go back and look at that life cycle again. So what is another thing that is unique and how does that relate back to those anatomical differences? Well, um, we're starting to see if we compare mosses and liverworts to ferns, we're seeing a kind of reversal in size of haploid and diploid structures, right? So the gametophyte is now the structure that is small and ephemeral, right? 
in ferns. Yeah. And the sporophyte is the like big old long lasting thing. Yes. Um, and so there's a couple different things going on here, right? One, we're still dependent on water for sperm, right? So we can't reproduce without it being fairly moist. So while moss, while ferns can live in drier places overall because they have better water retention capabilities, um, they can't. They still can't reproduce, at least not sexually, right? Unless there's enough moisture for sperm to swim, right? So we're still at least somewhat dependent on you know, sort of ambient moisture, not just water in the soil, right? But ambient moisture. Um, so that's not any different, right? That's something that's the same. Um, we're able to start getting much larger plants though. And the reason that we have much larger sporophytes, some are huge by the way, right? So I don't know if you've ever seen a tree fern, right? But tree ferns are tall, right? A tree fern is easily, you know, taller than you. Okay, um, some of them are much taller than that. And in fact, there's a lovely um, picture in your in the packet pages that are in Canvas that shows some images of very tall ferns, right? So ferns can be quite large. Um, what's, responsibility, what's responsible for that? Well, now we're dealing with that challenge of, um, of gravity, right? So how do we get big? Turns out, Vascular tissue helps with that too, okay? So I'm just gonna, I'm running out of space here. So vascular tissue is also important for increasing size, right? Because vascular tissue is very sturdy and has thick cell walls. And that's what allows um, plants to be much, much taller than the more ancestral non-vascular plants were, right? These guys are all, you know, real short. Whereas these guys, like I said, can be easily taller than a human. Um, and back in the day when the dinosaurs were roaming around, they were, you know, even taller than how tall they are now, right? So um, they were Genormo, okay? Um, so that's another sort of use of um, vascular tissue is it's not just, important for its vascular capabilities, but it's also important for size because it has those sort of thick cell walls that can um, stand up against uh, gravity situations, okay? All right, where are we? Okay, so we did a life cycle of ferns and then in lab we, right? Oh, look how cute, oh, how fun. Oh, look at the saurus with the sporangia, this particular saurus does not have an indusium. Not all of them do. Most of them do. Not all of them do, right? I hope that you're somewhat familiar with this life cycle because we did in fact draw it and we looked at multiple different stages, right? So we looked at this area where you could write the heart situation with the little rhizoid kind of root-ish things but are not truly roots. Um, and with the archegonia and the antheridia. And look, here's that little gametophyte, our little heart-shaped gametophyte and the sporophyte's like, like growing out of it and it grows so big that this you know the if i just um and then there's our big one right so i'm hoping that that's all cool okay um for horse tails we only really looked at we looked at a dry dead plant and we looked at the strobilus so for all of what we call the fern allies the um the relatives of ferns um, they keep their um, sporangia in this cone-like structure called a strobilus. Like a pine cone, yeah. Cone-like contains sporangia. Right. And so that's what the strobilus looks like on a horsetail or a member of phylum Equisetophyta. Um, and so this is what the gametophyte looks like. It doesn't look like a heart. It looks like a sad thing. And then this is the sporophyte. And then there's the, the strobilus with the sporangia, which make the spores. And there's the spores. And look at, they have these, those are fun little 
corkscrew thingy majiggers. What do you think the benefit of those is? Because a plant, keep in mind, right? Energy is a thing, right? Energy is limited. So organisms typically don't make structures that have no use, typically, right? So there's probably some beneficial function of those little curly cues sticking out of the spore. What do you think they are? Yeah, I'm going to wait till somebody says something. Would it be, <clears throat> would it be for like sticking to a surface? I love that thought process. That's fantastic. It, it potentially, but they more, and it's kind of hard to tell from the image, but they act more like little wings. Right. So by extending the surface area of the spore, they act like little wings, which make it easier for them to blow around. Yeah. And that like winged structure allows better dispersal of the spores, moves them farther away from their parent. Okay. So wings for farther dispersal. Right. And so I joke around about this, but it's true. Um, it's true of plants as much as it is humans, right? There comes a point when you got to kick your kids out of your house, <laughs> right? And so when organisms reproduce, right, um, you, it, it's in the, the best interest of everyone for the offspring to move some distance from their parents because they don't want to compete. They don't want to, okay? Like it's, you know, decided. It's not, it's not good if parents and their offspring are competing for resources right? That's not beneficial to anyone. So by having better dispersal of your offspring, right, it reduces that competition and that's better, better for everyone concerned, right? So this is the way that the, you know, young, <laughs> um, the, the young gametophytes essentially, right? Because the spore is going to become a gametophyte are sent away from where the parent is. Okay, so that's beneficial. And that's a theme that we're going to see quite a bit in all plants, right? So when we were talking about our bryophytes, there's not a lot of anything you can do to get these. I mean, the spores, they kind of fling a little bit, but they're not going very far, right? Whereas when we start talking about our vascular plants, we're talking about more sophisticated methods of sp spores being. Um, spread. So there are some ferns that literally have these little structures that kind of look like a little, like a, like a trebuchet that like fling their spores, right? They kind of like rotate around and like spin um, to fling their spores away. Um, or spores have little wings, right? So that they move farther from the parent, right? So we have more effective um, spore dispersal in our um, vascular plants than we did in our non-vascular plants. Okay. Um, and then in addition to our horsetails, we also have our lycophytes, right? So our lycophyta. Um, and so this one kind of looks like the, um, it's not the same species as the um, resurrection plant that we have, but it, it, it looks similar to it, I think. I think you look at that and you can say, yeah, sure, that looks like it. Right. And here's a club moss that looks maybe a little bit like the, the preserved club moss that you saw in lab. Right. So these guys also have these stroboli, which is where the um, sporangia are going to be located. OK, so we haven't talked about whisk ferns. Whisk ferns are cool looking, um, but I don't have examples to show you in class regularly. Um, I, I found one during the pandemic. I was really bummed that class wasn't in person because I was like, dude, it's a whisk fern and I can't yet. I don't even know anybody to show it to. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> so th this is another fern ally, another relative of the ferns. Um, but one of the things that I find kind of interesting is that depending on who you ask, um, some people put the ferns, the horsetails, and the whisk ferns all in one phylum. So it's called phylum monolophyta 
Um, I don't, I'm not a fan because <laughs> I feel like, no, they're different enough that they should be in different phyla. So that's how I treat it. I, I'm of the, the opinion that they should not be considered the same phylum. So that's how we do it in lab. I tend to be more of a splitter than a lumper as far as classification goes. I like smaller groups rather than bigger groups. Okay. Um, so yeah. Okay. Now, one other really important thing to be thinking about here is that there's another thing that's happening, particularly within our Leica fights. And that is that our sexes are becoming more differentiated. Okay. So I'm going to add to my list here. I'm going to say, oop, kick characters. So we have vascular tissues for moving fluids and for um, growing taller, right? We're starting to have true plant organs. Um, we're also seeing plants now that are sporophyte dominant, right? Which relates back to that, sporophyte dominant and we're starting to see greater differentiation between the sexes okay so i'm looking at my watch to see how we're doing on time because I'm not gonna make you do more than an hour and a half worth of lecture like usual, because that's mean, right? So remember one of the things that we were looking at when we were looking at in lab, the stroboli of, how many different stroboli did we look at? We looked at the equicetum strobilis, and then we looked at a lycophyte strobilis, and then we looked at um, selaginella, I think was the third one. And we were looking for a phenomenon <laughs> of are these homosporous or heterosporous, right? So once again, this you are familiar with based on looking at in lab. And so now we're ready to kind of make that go away. Um, let, now we're ready to kind of talk about the significance of that, right? So the vast majority, all of the non-vascular plants and the vast majority of the seedless vascular plants um, are homosporous. So they have one type of spore, right? And so that one type of spore, one type. Sorry, that's where the gap is in my screen that doesn't, there's like an area like right here where my, see where I'm, yeah. Excuse me, there's an area in my screen that just is like, nope. I can't, I cannot work there. Okay. So because there's only one type of spore, there's only one type of sporangium, right? So the sporangia all make the same kind of spore and those spores make bisexual gametes or in the case of mosses, they make separate male and female gametophytes, right? But the vast majority of the um, seedless vascular plants have a gametophyte that has both male and female parts, right? Archegonia and antheridia that make the, the sperm and the eggs. The selaginella with its heterosporous cones is the first plant that we've talked about that is heterosporous. Every plant we talk about after this is going to also be heterosporous, okay? So heterosporous, heterospory, is this idea that there are both micro and megaspores, different based on their size. They are produced in entirely different sporangia, right? So the microspores, as you might expect, are produced in microsporangia. The megaspores, as you might expect, are produced in megasporangia. The sporangia are not necessarily, themselves are not necessarily big or small. The mega and micro refer to the spore. So a microsporangium might be relatively large, but what it's producing are microspores, okay? Whereas a megasporangium might be relatively small, but what it's producing are megaspores, okay? So in the case of our selaginella, right? Those two sporangia, the sporangia themselves were about the same size, 
right? What was different about them was the types of spores that were inside, whether or not the spores were large or small, not so much the sporangia themselves. Is that okay? Can I, can I get some thumbs up reactions if that's okay? Let's play with our, let's play with our tools. Hey, Ruby got the thumbs up. Vive got the thumbs up. Yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. Tyler's got the thumbs up. Natalie, all right, I'm gonna assume the rest of you just didn't feel like playing my reindeer games with the thing. And Denise has got it in the chat, woo woo. Okay, um, so, um, so we're starting to see more separation. The significance of that is probably not obvious yet because it's not even obvious to me yet, okay? But that's what we're starting to see. And that's why, quite frankly, that's why we look at so many um, stroboli in, um, in lab because I want you to be able to see that transition of the vast majority of them are, hetero are homosporous, but then we see one group that is heterosporous because what we are supposed to be looking at in lab today is everybody now is, is heterosporous later, okay? So here's an image of that, right? Ooh, no, what are you doing? Why are you not letting me draw on you? Oh, cause you're in the bad part of the screen. So what am I circling? What are these, what, what is the, the body that I'm circling here? The sporangia. So those, each one of those things that I circled was a sporangium, right? Or sporangia, plural, yeah? Okay. Each of the little individual dots are the? Spores. Spores. And so in this case, we're just calling them spores because they're all the same size. Whereas over here, what is this guy? A micro Good. And this is a? Mega. Mega sporangium. And the micro sporangium, even though it's the same size roughly as the mega sporangium, is called that because, yes, it has the I was here um, because it has the microspores in it, whereas the megasporangium has Megasporus. really big spores. <laughs> right now, one thing that is misleading about this diagram that I don't want you to think is always the case is it just so happens that the example that they chose here all of the megasporangia are on one side and then all of the microsporangia are on the other side. That is not always true. It's, it's random, right? So sometimes they go like switch back and forth. Sometimes you have a couple on one side and then a couple on the other side, right? It, they're not lined up like this. Okay. So this lining up is not like a real phenomenon. Okay. It just happens to be in this example. Okay. All right, so then blah, 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 some info about our club mosses or ground cedar, right? Our lycophytes, our whisk ferns, our um, fern ferns, <laughs> um, and our horsetails. <clears throat> Excuse me, gotta keep that coffee going, right? Notice that for all of these, the life cycle has switched completely to sporophyte dominant. So whereas our bryophytes were all gametophyte dominant, these are all sporophyte dominant, right? And there's real fun little like tidbits about these guys, about how common they are, how many different species there are, where they live, you know, blah, 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 blah. Some early uses, which is fun, right? People like to eat young leaves of ferns. They're called fiddleheads. Evidently, they're delicious. I can't say that I've ever had one, which is really something that I need to fix. I need to eat those. I need to know what that's like. Um, anyway, okay. Um, so as always, as, as is always true of these tables, you know, peruse them to get a feel for like, oh, there really aren't that many <laughs> different species of this, right? Um, and a little bit of interesting stuff about diversity and all of that, but you know, anyway, okay. All right, so where we're going next, and this is the big scary thing that we're doing next, is now we are switching, now we're moving on to gymnosperms, okay? So 
we're going to go back to our little tree here and I'm going to erase all of this and actually the gymnosperms I'm going to type my list out as we draw a life cycle because I think that that will be better because it's going to be a long list and as you saw from this I already don't I don't have enough room for a small list let alone a big list so I'm just erasing this so that our diagram is no longer cluttered all right and so Okay. Hmm. There are a few things that I'm seeing. Right. One of them is wood, and the other one that they don't even put on here, which is like disturbing to me, is seeds. Okay. So we're gonna end. Nope, I don't want to keep, I can, I, we can discard those, that's fine. All right, so I'm going to close that for a minute, and I'm going to open up a Word document so that I can draw, okay? And I, I, did, I slept on my shoulder bad, you guys, I'm old, okay? And I thought what we would attempt to do here is we would attempt poorly to draw a gymnosperm life cycle, okay? So what do we expect is going to be the dominant generation? Do we expect it's going to be a sporophyte or a gametophyte? Based on the previous groups. You got a 50% chance. <laughs> what you got, Natalie? I saw you unmuted. You were brave for a second. That's horrifying. <laughs> right. right. Or you're like, I'm also looking at the PowerPoint lady, whatever. All right. So um, for our gymnosperm life cycle, I'm going to use specifically, I'm going to use a, a conifer, a pine tree as an example. Okay. What gymnosperms are is they are the vascular seeded plants. So not only do they have vascular tissue because that was, you know, happened in the previous burst of, you know, new hotness in, um, in our ferns and their friends. So these guys have vascular tissue. But in addition to that, the other really big deal is that now we have things called seeds, okay? And we're gonna investigate, we're gonna find out what a seed actually is. I know you're thinking to yourself, I know what a seed is, but do you, do you really, really know what a seed is? I don't know, we'll find out, won't we, okay? So here's what I wanna do. I want to actually make this a little bit bigger. There we go. So I have a little more drawing space, okay? So we're gonna start because, um, because we can. Um, we're gonna start with a spore fight, all right? So, sporophyte dominant, let me get it back at 12, alternation of, ooh, there's some people in the chat. <laughs> nice good 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 if you guys are doing it in the chat just not saying that loud see i need to get used to checking the chat all right okay so i'm gonna draw my spore fight And as you recall, our mature sporophytes are diploid, okay? Yay, all right. Now, what you need to know about conifers is conifers keep their sporangia inside of stroboli also. So remember 
the strobel eye of these guys. Strobel eye, right? Strobel eye. Strobel eye. Strobel eye. Okay. Gymnosperms have strobel eye also. Typically, we refer to their strobel eye as cones, though. All right. So a sporophyte has heterosporous strobel eye. So we have male cones. And those male cones are going to have what kind of sporangia? Micro? Yes, right? Okay, and then we're also gonna have female cones, which have, oh yeah, there's my bad part of my screen, that have mega sporangia. Yeah, bad part of the screen. Does this make sense? So not only do we now have this, you know, heterosporous situation, right? But it's so extreme that they're in completely separate structures. And so one of the fun things that we would have done in lab today is we would have been on a little walk where we talk about, hey, here's a female cone. Hey, here's a male cone. How do they look different? How do I know which one's which? Blah, 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 okay? So we'll have to pause on that and do that a little bit later, okay? Um, since you know so much about life cycles already, right? You probably know what sporangia do, probably. So what happens to our sporangia? They undergo a process to make something. What are they making and what is the process? Uh, do they go through meiosis to create spores? Beautiful. So here's the thing about life cycles. They're a pain in the butt and they're all different in their details, but there are some things that you start to see a pattern emerge and it's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm getting it, right? So our microsporangia are going to undergo meiosis to produce things called Micro spores, my micro that sucked. Okay, you you'll anyway. I'll fix it later. Okay. They are still. Why did I change to blue? By the way, we're going to help with. I mean, because yeah. we're in a haploid generation now, right? We're in the gametophyte generation, okay? Um, they are still inside of the microsporangia though, right? So still in microsporangia, right? That's where, they're, that's where they're stashed, right? Even though they themselves are haploid, okay? And what do spores do? Mitosis, they go through mitosis. Okay. And turn into? Mature gametophytes. Gametophytes, okay. So in this case, our male gametophyte right? is produced as a result of mitosis, right? And so we get this male gametophyte and it's multicellular, right? Because we undergo mitosis. We'll look at actual pictures in a second. Right now, I just wanna kind of do the cycle with words, okay? Um, so we get this male gametophyte and this male gametophyte um, is actually <laughs> a structure that we use a different name to describe it. So. Our male gametophyte, we typically call it pollen, 
right? So if you are somebody that is allergic to pollen, it makes you sneeze. What you're, what's causing you to sneeze are male gametophytes, <laughs> right? So I'm allergic to male gametophytes. They make me sneeze. All right. And so <laughs> that, which is kind of absurd, but fun, right? I got the fun facts in here, you guys. Good for conversations around the dinner table. Um, so as you know, gametophytes produce something. What do they produce? Egg and sperm. Well, in the case of a male gametophyte, they're only going to make sperm. Okay, we'll come back to the female in a second. And so what process is it? Mitosis. Right, it's mitosis because we're already haploid. We can't, you know, we can't do meiosis. Okay, so inside of the pollen grain, you have the production of sperm. right? And there's actually two that form inside each pollen grain. And um, well, I shouldn't say two, there's not two sperm, but there's two haploid cells. There's a sperm. And then there's this other guy called a tube nucleus, which we'll look at in a second. Okay. Um, and those are made inside of the male gametophyte. Okay. And all of this is still, right, stored inside of the microsporangium until we get to the pollen. And then the pollen flies away. Okay. And so it's able to fly because once again, it has these winged structures and that image that I just drew, my very fancy drawing, might remind you a little bit of Mickey Mouse because that is what pine pollen looks like. It kind of looks like Mickey Mouse. So the whole thing is the gametophyte, right? Or the pollen. And there's these nuclei, one of which is the sperm and one of which is something called a tube nucleus that are inside of, the, of Mickey's head. And then the ears are these little like wings that allow it to have surface area to kind of like catch some air and fly away like a kite, okay? So we're going to pause for a moment and get caught up on our female side okay so let's do that so back to my female so my female cones um have megasporangia inside of them and so if they have megasporangia inside of them what are they going to make oh nope that's not what i wanted i want this i want that so megasporangia Megas they create megaspores. Okay, and that process is also meiosis. Meiosis. Mega spore. Oop, can't spell. Yeah. They are still inside of, you know, as you're used to thinking about, right? The female parts typically stick around to wherever they are, right? So the megaspores stay inside of the megasporangia and the megaspores eventually undergo mitosis to produce a female gametophyte. And that female gametophyte, let's scroll down a little bit here. trying to leave room for them to come together, right? So our female gametophyte is also still trapped inside of the female cone, okay? So it's still trapped in there. And the female gametophyte is gonna do what? undergo mitosis to produce eggs. eggs eggs you got it 
Okay. All right. So we have, despite my really crappy drawing, you guys thought my drawings on the board were bad. This is real bad. Um, <laughs> despite my really crappy drawings, um, the sperm find their way to the egg, but this time the sperm never leave the pollen grain. So the sperm are still enclosed within the male gametophyte. So the sperm are not swimming anywhere, at least not yet, okay? And so the wind <laughs> carries our, I don't wanna do this. Uh -uh. Let's do a different color for wind. Let's do another color for wind. I need a new, can I get a new pencil? Is it gonna let me? Is it gonna be a jerk? I don't like an action pen. I want, oh, you know what? I'll use this, but I'm gonna change the color. I'm gonna change my color to that. Okay, so my pollen grain is gonna blow in the wind. Okay, that's supposed to be wind. <laughs> okay, so our little pollen grain blows in the wind over to where the female gametophyte is, which is still inside of the megasporangium, right? And eventually that little pollen grain is going to generate a little tube that will basically make a little tunnel for the sperm to swim directly to the egg. Oh wait, okay, so. So our sperm swims through a tube to the egg. So it's enclosed moist space, right? And then it gets to the egg. And what happens when the sperm and the egg come together? Fertilization. Beautiful. Okay, and what do we have now? A zygote. Since my screen is better, contain, nope. It's not gonna let me up there, is it? Okay, so we have our zygote, which is right, we're back to we're back to two in. N. N. Two N. Okay. Now the interesting thing about that is that this is all still inside of here. So this is still inside the female cone from the other sporophyte, right? From the previous sporophyte generation, still in there, okay? So the zygote forms, right? And it kind of looks something like this. You have your two end zygote and it looks like a little baby plant. Well, after, you know, it has to do a little bit of, it has to do a little bit of cell division first. So let's do the, let's show the cell division. So there's a little mitosis. I can't write it because my screen sucks. Okay, so um, here's our little baby plant. Nope, we want red, thank you very much. We want red. Okay, so this is my baby plant, my embryo, if you will. Okay, and it is embedded within, if we go back, right? The female gametophyte. Okay. Yeah, and then we've got this like coat. All 
around the outside that's protective. Okay. And that whole structure all together. I'm going to use a different color just so we can see it. Right. That whole structure, we're going to call this whole thing. Right. Is called a seed. Right. So a seed is the embryo plus the female gametophyte plus a seed coat. Okay. And this is a big deal. And the reason that it's a big deal is that seeds are essentially like little like stasis chambers. So the way that I always like to describe this is using a superhero reference. So Superman way back in, in Krypton, right? His parents threw him in this little, you know, pod, right? To send him away because bad stuff was going down on the home planet, right? And so they put their offspring in a little pod Okay, so Superman is the embryo in this case. And they packed him up in that little pod with what he needed. So I'm assuming they don't show this in the movies, but I'm assuming they put lots of snacks in there, right? Because what do you do when you're taking your kids on a long trip? You have to have snacks because they need to eat all the time, right? So seeds also contain nutritive tissue or as I like to say, snacks. And so the snacks for our little baby embryo in order for it to survive while it's trapped inside of its little pod, right? The snacks are the female gametophyte, right? So the female gametophyte serves as nutritive tissue. if I could type. And the seed coat is for protection until the time is right in order for that little embryo to start growing. Okay, so this is, this is a really big deal because this is a huge advantage, right? If you can create offspring and set them up so that they don't need to start growing and photosynthesizing and doing all of that stuff until conditions are right. If you can sort of set them up in a little stasis chamber so they can hang out until things are good, right? That is a huge advantage, right? In our other groups, we didn't have that. That wasn't a possibility, right? Because if we go back and we look at our ferns, it's like spores don't have any nutritive tissue, right? A spore is just a, you know, a single cell that needs to grow to produce a gametophyte. So it's either going to do it or it's going to fail, right? And then gametes also are not particularly robust. Yeah, so they're just single cells. So they're either going to grow or not, right? So, or they're going to fail, right? So the beautiful thing about a seed is that seeds essentially are this huge advantage, right? Of being able to kind of hold on to that next generation of sporophyte until the time is right. So what do I mean by that? Maybe wait until spring when it's nice and wet and it's the beginning of the season. So we know it's gonna, the plant 
knows it's going to be warm for a little while, right? Or maybe right now the forest is too crowded. And so we're waiting for conditions where um, there's less competition, right? So there's all these reasons why um, seeds are beneficial. In addition to the fact that seeds are also often really useful as a disperse, dispersal tactic, right? So we talked a second ago about like, you know, kids getting, you gotta get your kids out of your house, right? So having seeds that disperse is also really, really beneficial for the parent plant because then they're not competing with their own offspring, okay? So let's look at the actual like illustration of all of this. Okay, so here's our mature sporophyte. Ain't it cute? It has two different kinds of cones. Now here they're calling this an ovulate cone. We called it a female cone, same diff, right? Um, so anything that you think of when you like mentally picture a pine cone is an ovulate cone, a female cone, okay? The things that you may not have ever noticed before on the tips of the pine branches that are these little teeny tiny, tiny, tiny little cones, those are the male cones, okay? And the male cones, as you know, are gonna have the microsporangia inside of them, like the ovulate cones or the female cones have the megasporangia inside of them, all right? And those little microsporangia make microspores. And that little microspore becomes a pollen grain, which is our male gametophyte. Look, it looks like Mickey Mouse. Okay. And it's dispersed by the wind, flies around because of those little ears, right? Eventually it lands on the female. Okay. So meanwhile, with the female, we've got these megasporangia. There's our megasporangia. And it has something called a mother cell. It gets sort of confusing here, right? But the idea is that you have the megasporangium that has this cell. It undergoes meiosis to produce a mega, they do a really crappy job of showing it here, but that megasporangium undergoes meiosis to produce a megaspore. And then that megaspore is a female gametophyte. And then that female gametophyte is what produces the egg. And they don't show any of that step here, which I don't really like. It's like, how did we get from this to here? I don't know what happened here, right? But that, that's how it works, okay? So we've got our um, egg right there and we've got our pollen grain, right? Cause our pollen blew over to the female, right? And that pollen grain, it grows a little too and that little tube is going to carry our little sperm to the egg. And that egg gets fertilized, becomes a zygote, it's 2N, and then it grows a little bit bigger. And now we call it an embryo. So here's our little embryo. Oh, it's a baby plant. It's so cute. And that little embryo is still encased within the female gametophyte, right? And so that female gametophyte contains fat and protein and starch, right? And various other, you know, nutrients that are necessary to keep our little, our little embryo alive until the day when it busts out of the seed, okay? So a seed is a multi, multi-generational structure, okay? And so in the case of pines, um, the seeds have these little wing-like structures on the outside of them typically. Um, so they can be dispersed by wind, but the way that it seems to happen most is by animals, right? So squirrels will go and as soon as a female cone opens up so that the seeds can be removed, right? The little squirrels get their little paws in there and they pull them out, right? And the thing about squirrels that's charming is that they eat some of them probably right away. But the other thing that squirrels do is they stash them, right? Squirrels are, are food hoarders, which is smart, right? Um, but the funny thing about that is squirrels are also dumb. 
<laughs> and so squirrels will hide their seeds that they collect places and then forget about them. Or sometimes along the way, they drop them. So even though squirrels primarily, their intention is to act as a seed predator, right? To eat the seeds. Um, incidentally, they are really good seed dispersers because they drop stuff, <laughs> right? So our squirrel is gonna carry that seed away with the intention of eating it, but then it never gets eaten, you know, or a coyote eats the squirrel or whatever, right? And that seed now has been moved away. It has been dispersed from its parent. Right, and that little seed germinates. That's what they call it when the little seed pops open and the little baby embryo starts to grow. Um, and there we have our little baby sporophyte, and you know, and there you go. Okay, so Freeman version. Campbell version. I don't really like either of them. <laughs> just because I feel like they're super confusing about like, what am I, what am I actually looking at here? Right? So it's like, okay, well, here's that female cone. It's got this thing called an ovule. I don't really care if you know it. And then they're talking about what's a megasporocyte. What? So I tried to use some of the same vocabulary that we had been using, because I think that's easier to understand than how they present it here okay so anyway so that's a pine life cycle right and so here's a little picture that's focusing on um i like this picture because it's focusing on the um megasporangium right which makes the megaspore and that megaspore becomes a female gametophyte because spores always become gametophytes and that female gametophyte then undergoes mitosis to produce an egg. Yeah. And then that, meanwhile, our little pollen grain is flying over here and there's this little opening and it gets wedged in there. And that little tube nucleus grows. And then the sperm <laughs> swims through that little tube to fertilize our egg. Ta-da, we have a zygote which then grows into an embryo. And the thing that irritates me here is that they say, oh, the food supply, right? The nutritive tissue, the snacks, if you will, right? It tells you that they're haploid, but it doesn't maintain the fact that, guess what? They're haploid because they are essentially from the female gametophyte, right? So that food supply is female gametophyte, right? And then the sporophyte makes this tough seed coat around the outside to protect that seed until it's ready for prime time, okay? And there's a picture of one. And so someday when we are allowed back on campus, even though I will add there is absolutely no damage to the zoology lab. So in theory, we could be there right now learning, expanding our minds, but no, I'm a little bitter, sorry. Um, right? We will look at these someday, okay? We got an embryo and it's surrounded by nutritive tissue, snacks, right? And then there's this protective coat around the outside, okay? So that's what a seed is, yeah? And so what we were going to do for lab today is we were going to go around campus and we we're going to look at some different conifers that have cones. We were also going to look at other gymnosperms, other seeded plants. We we're going to look at cycads and we we're going to look at kinkos. We don't have any neophytes on campus, so we weren't going to look at those, right? But um, yeah, we were going to we were going to have a good time. And then we were also going to look at some angiosperms on campus as well while we were out there. You know, might as well two birds, one stone. That whole you know that whole thing, right? Um, but alas, okay. So. Um, That's enough of me yammering at you for today, I think. Okay. So what we're going to do on Thursday for lecture is, I, this will actually be perfect. What we'll do on Thursday is we'll go back to that, the phylogenetic tree, and we'll write out the, the new hotness for the gymnosperms that make them, you know, even more well-suited to take on land 
right? And so we'll make a kind of a detailed list of that. And then we'll talk about the life cycle of angiosperms and go from there, okay? Anybody have any questions about anything? If you came in late, let me just say that I don't have answers to like, how are we fixing the schedule yet? But I will, and I will absolutely post them as announcements as soon as I do, right? So keep your eyes on the announcements in Canvas and you might want to in your profile, um, set it up so that your the announcements get sent to your, um, either a push, push notification, <laughs> push notification to your phone or at least to your email so you get them immediately so that you know what the announcements are you know well in advance and you don't miss any um so i will notify you guys what the what the plan is for thursday um as soon as i know at a minimum we'll do another zoom lecture like this at a minimum right um and i really like i said i don't see the point of starting at eight unless we have lab <laughs> so i hope that was okay with you all but i was calling a you know calling an audible of me and like, you know what? I don't want to be like camera ready at 8 a.m. if I don't have to be. So um, yeah, okay. So for sure, we'll at least have lecture. We might be able to do all of it in the lab though, but you'll find that out later today. Okay, questions about anything? I hate Zooming you guys because I don't get to see your faces and I don't get to see your confused faces and I don't get to see your, yay, I understand something faces and it totally bums me out. But um, I'm glad that this is not a permanent problem and we can be back together so that I can see your confusion <laughs> soon. Okay. All right. Doesn't look like there are any questions in the chat. Nobody's unmuting themselves. So I'm going to assume that means you're ready to go. I'll stick around for another minute, but I'm going to stop recording now. I am sure 